Do you know what the ideal dog is? And I'm not saying like, Oh, my Mr. Blimby is the most perfect and well-behaved and well-groom the dog. I'm asking in what dog can we look at and say that that dog represents all dogs. It's the paragon of dogs or the amalgamated dog or the perfect schema of a dog. There's so many different types of dogs that come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. Some don't even look like a dog. Sometimes I just gotta this? trust someone if they say this is a dog. So, is there a singular dog that is just undeniably Bam. the dog? Yeah. How about trees? Same problem applies for trees, but what would be the ideal tree? Now, our subject today is not as complex or varied as what was mentioned before. I'm just asking, what is the ideal controller? What controller can define all controllers and say, this is the perfect Paragon controller? I believe we are approaching that ideal controller with each generation of consoles, and I would like to show my approximation of the perfect controller. Well, at least for me. Controllers for home consoles used to come in all sorts of wacky shapes and configurations, from the Atari 2600 joystick to the Nintendo 64 controller, we see a variety of outlines, buttons, and colors. I see that Nintendo's keeping that tradition alive. However, over time we see how controllers evolve into a certain shape. Let's take a look at each of the big three and see how each of their controllers evolved. So here's the original Famicom NES controller from 1983. It's a wired controller with four buttons, two of which are used for playing the games, and the other two are to start and select. It also includes a directional pad, or D-pad, for which Nintendo patented as the plus control pad? Cross control pad? I don't know. I also don't know why, but some maniac at Nintendo decided to put B before A, inadvertently causing a chain of confusing design choices across all controller button layouts. Following is the Super Famicom slash SNES controller from 1990, both versions now nearly identical, said Nintendo thinks Americans like the color purple. There are now two additional buttons to play with, Y and X. It also comes in a curved design, so corners are no longer jabbed into your palms. It also makes it easier to use the two new shoulder buttons. Next is the Nintendo 64 controller from 1996. It has three grips, confusing everyone in how to hold it. The middle grip has one of the first analog sticks on the controller and the Z trigger underneath. The face buttons are now just directional C buttons as a kind of secondary D-pad. Two buttons are then added underneath the C buttons, A and B. Up next is the GameCube controller from 2001. Nintendo now thinks that everyone likes the color purple. It has two asymmetrically placed sticks and asymmetry seems to be the general theme for this controller with the C-stick also being slightly smaller, the face buttons being smushed to prioritize, ah. and the Z-button only being on the right side. However, the odd layout of the controller out of everything else at the time actually ended up being one of the most influential designs for modern controllers. Then there's the Wii Remote from 2006, completely redesigned to focus sorely on motion controls. Equipped with Bluetooth, an accelerometer, a gyroscope, an infrared sensor, a speaker, and a wrist strap. It's also accompanied by the nunchuck for double the motion control fun. It kind of looks like they just ripped out the middle of an N64 controller to make it. There's also some other more traditional controllers for the Wii. <laughs> now here's the infamous Wii U gamepad from 2012. A controller for a completely separate new console because that was confusing. Nintendo probably hit the maximum of what you can add to a controller because this thing is kitted out. Its most salient feature is the touchscreen, but it also has a camera, microphone, speaker, headphone jack, stylus, accelerometer, gyroscope, NFC reader, infrared sensor, all the standard controller inputs, an on and off button, and finally the TV button to turn it into a remote. Just to remind you, this is just a controller, not an independent handheld device like the Nintendo Switch. If you get too far from the console, the screen will stop, the controller will disconnect, and it will be completely useless. Just like the rest of the console. There's also the Pro Controller with only a fourth of the features. 
Finally, we have the Joy-Con from 2017, detachable controllers from the Nintendo Switch that can both act as one controller or be split to act as two. A super cool idea for a controller, especially for a handheld. What makes it even cooler is that sometimes the sticks just take control and play games for you. Just not well. It also comes with motion controls, an NFC reader, an infrared camera for one game, and a capture button following PlayStation's share button. At first I thought it was cool that the plus and minus buttons are in the shape of the actual symbols, but then it turned out to be a terrible idea since they're painful to push. God, imagine if PlayStation copied that idea. The Switch might be my favorite console, but man does Joy-Con drift hinder me from not even playing the games but just using it in general. But there's the Pro Controller with the same features except for the infrared camera, so not as good. Look, if I can't pretend to eat a sandwich with a controller, then what's the point of existing anymore? So evidently, Nintendo's not afraid of innovating and redesigning everything with each generation. Barely any controller resembles the previous. Nintendo can be as wildly creative as they always are, while staying up to par with some trends. Although, Nintendo is always better at setting trends rather than following them. Here's the original PlayStation controller from 1994. It looks a bit similar to the SNES controller, but with grips and four buttons on the back. Sony made a segmented D-pad to avoid infringing on Nintendo's patent and used four symbols for the face buttons. These symbols are now an iconic trademark of PlayStation, featuring a triangle, circle, cross, and yes, it's referred to as a cross, and square. Each actually has an intended meaning. Triangle is supposed to represent a viewpoint or direction, square is supposed to represent maps or menus, cross represents no, and circle represents yes. The placement was meant to replicate the SNES's placement of its confirm button to remain consistent. However, this isn't the case anymore as cross now means yes and circle means no. We can perhaps blame Xbox for the Switch, but I'll elaborate later. Eventually came the dual analog controller for the same PlayStation from 1997. It adds two analog sticks and an extra button to toggle the analogs on and off. Because at the time, people asked, why would I ever use this? Adding two sticks is already genius enough, but another stroke of genius is the fact that the sticks click in and hide two extra buttons underneath. A fantastic way of adding more functionality in subtle ways rather than just putting on more face buttons. Then came the DualShock later that same year. It adds rumble capabilities. Thus, shocking. Alright, next is the DualShock 2 for the PlayStation 2 from 2000. Lots of twos. It's basically the same design but black, showing that Sony is a coward. They added pressure sensitive buttons which were cool. These buttons could tell how hard you pushed in and some games utilized this, but in mostly subtle ways. This tech is largely abandoned now though. Next is the 6x. Next is the 6 axis for the PlayStation 3 from 2006. Yet again, similar to the DualShock 2, but now supports motion controls for movements on the three axes, X, Y, and Z. Look, they really wanted the name to be a palindrome, so six, I guess. It's also wireless and replaces the analog toggle with the piss button. A year later came the DualShock 3 for the PS3. It adds rumble and haptics. That's it. Well, I guess these count. Uh, here's the PlayStation Move controllers from 2010. Adding to the list of things Sony copied from Nintendo, they're basically similar to the Wii Remote and Nunchuck, but in PlayStation style. Pretty cool though how they were supported six years later for the PSVR. Up next is the DualShock 4 for the PlayStation 4 from 2013. This time with a major redesign while keeping the same structure. It has been overhauled with more features too, now including a touchpad, light bar, speaker, headphone jack, and a share button. Honestly, most of these features are useless or underutilized, but at least it wasn't a Wii U gamepad. However, barely any game, even first party, uses the touchpad. The light bar is used for the camera and VR, but not many people have either. The most influential feature ended up being the least flashy, the share button which is seen on the latest Nintendo and the Xbox controllers. Finally, here's the DualSense for the PlayStation 5 from 2020. 
Oh my god, it's almost been two years and people still can't find a PS5. The controller is redesigned once more, now outlined in a more familiar shape. The new features include more impressive haptics, adaptive triggers, and a microphone. These features are, I feel, more essential than that of the DualShock 4. I would definitely like to see similar haptics and adaptive triggers in other controllers. The microphone's also nice if it wasn't so invasive. <laughs> It's on by default without people knowing, and it records you during shared clips. So Sony liked to play it safe at first, before taking more steps to innovate. I mean, the controller looked largely the same for three generations, but then it evolved slightly over time. Then came the most recent controllers that pack in more features and redesigns, however, most features are just amenities. The only new feature so far to be adopted by other controllers is the share button, but I appreciate Sony's effort to innovate regardless. Oof, off to a rough start was this one. First off is the Xbox controller, or the Duke, <laughs> from 2001. It is as uncomfortable to use as it is to look at. It's just so unwieldy and chunky. It has two analog sticks, two analog triggers, the worst D-pad I've ever seen, and six face buttons that are... italicized? Finally, there's the big Xbox logo slapped on top. Doesn't do anything. It's, it's not a button. Thankfully, a year later, a better controller was made, the Xbox Controller S. This was really where the shapes started to form. Now, the biggest influence of the first Xbox controller were from the buttons. Xbox also uses ABXY, but the buttons are switched from Nintendo's buttons. The layout for the letters are the same as Sega's controller, perhaps inspired by the Dreamcast controller in general. The biggest change comes from the color, making A green and B red. With A being green, it was just so intuitive to agree that the green button means yes and the red button no. It's definitely far more intuitive than PlayStation's cross the circle. Even Nintendo had the same principle for the GameCube controller, but this colorization then makes me question, what was Nintendo's initial intention for the colors of the SNES buttons? The Xbox colors were so intuitive for Western gamers that this might have been the cause for PlayStation Switch to cross being confirmed, especially after the 360 era of Xbox. And speaking of... Here's the Xbox 360 controller from 2005, the dog bone design with some good changes. The Xbox logo is actually a button now, with one of the first home buttons on a controller. The D-pad still sucks, but what I really like are the added bumpers. Continuing Xbox's intuitive labels, the buttons on the back are called the left, right bumpers and triggers, because these are definitely bumpers, and these are definitely triggers. This is so much better than Nintendo's labels or PlayStation's, because these mean nothing. When telling a person what to press, I prefer Xbox labels no matter what, and people can feel, yes, this is a trigger, and this must be a bumper. The controller is also wireless, but it uses AA battery, which really juts out of the controller. Up next is... what? These count? No, I'm not gonna talk about that. Or that. Up next is the Xbox wireless controller from 2013. Microsoft really thinks they peaked here because this controller works across all Xboxes from the Xbox One to the Series X. Not only that, but the Series X version works retroactively all the way back to the One. And honestly, I kinda agree. The design and the shape is great. It has minimal features compared to the other controllers at the time, but it has all the essentials. It even has a good D-pad. The only thing I hated about this controller is how clicky the bumpers are. This is all I hear when playing Sekiro. Thankfully, several revisions of the controller have been made, fixing those issues. Here's the 2020 revision that came with the Xbox Series X and S. It adds the share button, just like the PlayStation and Switch controllers, and an even better D-pad. My biggest gripe with these controllers are the price, though. They're $60, $10 less than the DualSense and Pro Controller. So either all of these extra features are only worth $10, or Microsoft really marked up the price of its controllers. Sure, they're nice, but they're more than the price of a whole game sometimes. 
Uh, here's the 2022 revision featuring a speaker. Actually, I, I, I don't know what this is. Microsoft set the standard for all modern controllers. Looking at the outlines of any other controller from other companies, the design could all be ascribed to Xbox. Not only the outline, but the inputs and format as well. There isn't much for innovation, but all the effort is definitely placed into perfect refinement. Now that we have gone through an overview of how each of the big three's controllers evolved and made their influences, I think we can more easily visualize the ideal controller. I'll try to mock up what I feel would be the most perfect controller. Alright, so here's what I came up with. For now, I'm not too concerned about aesthetics, just more so on functionality and features. Obviously, this would have to be the shape. This is what all controllers are evolving into, no matter what came before. Now, the shape would have to be further refined to account for different hand sizes, ergonomics, comfort, weight, and aesthetics. Moving on, the D-pad here would be based on PlayStation's D-pad. I kinda don't like the original D-pad since a wrong input can be made if pressed at the wrong angle. This can be best represented by Xbox's D-pad. Notice how there's a click even though I'm holding the right direction. I'm also pushing downward and since it's all one piece, the down input also gets pushed. I actually like the Switch's face button D-pad. I prefer it when playing games like Tetris to mitigate misinputs. But it's nice to have a D-pad, so PlayStation's design takes root. However, the, even the PlayStation D-pad is not actually segmented. Notice how the right side rises when the left side is depressed? The same problems occur, so I'd like to have this design but with actual segmented buttons. As for stick placement, whether asymmetrical or not, it really doesn't matter. If anyone complains, oh I'm trash because I'm not used to sticks being like this, they're lying. They're just trash in general. Okay, there's plenty of other excuses like sensitivity or stakes being too short, but placement is not the issue. If you want to be super technical, asymmetrical sticks are actually more ergonomic for most games. See, if you stretch out your hand and then relax your fingers, your thumbs would rest nicely on the outer parts of a controller. For most games, the left stick and the face buttons would be what you would interact with the most. Regardless, it doesn't matter all that much since your thumbs are only angled a bit downward. It's not like they're all the way down here, nor wearing the thumbs much. I chose the symmetrical placement more so for aesthetics than anything. Although I still kind of prefer asymmetrical. I'll call these group of buttons the menu buttons. These include your home button, share button, and plus or minus, start select, etc. I adjusted the home and share buttons to be on the outer edges of the resting thumb area or underneath. I stuck with plus and minus for pause and whatever since these are universally recognized symbols. The share and home button are swapped to enable players to keep moving while taking a screenshot or video. Although the swap might frustrate some people since the share button is commonly on the left side. I also got a microphone here, a great addition from PlayStation. Now everyone can have a mic, so there's no excuse to not be toxic. I mean, wholesome and supportive. The symbol would be a button with an LED to signify when it's muted, much like the DualSense. There's also a speaker above. Games can be cacophonous, so it's nice for the speaker to relay important sound cues such as having no ammo or shields being depleted. The speakers are a good way to prioritize sound since the controller will be closer than the screen for most people. Although having headphones would negate this feature. Now for the face buttons, I use the Xbox labels since the other controllers from other companies are also using them. I would have liked to make them as colorful as the original Xbox controllers since their colors are effective and intuitive in learning buttons. Aesthetically though, they do not seem well with most palettes. All of the big three have moved away from coloring their buttons. If color were to be added, it would be like this. On the top of the controller, I got the Xbox labels for the bumpers and triggers, since, yes, these are bumpers and triggers. 
They're more akin to PlayStation's buttons since I like them bigger, especially for Souls-like games. These would be an analog triggers and perhaps adaptive like the DualSense. I'm not sure if Sony's patent will allow other companies to replicate the triggers, but they do open up functionality in games. A great example is in Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart, where pushing the trigger halfway or fully would change how some weapons fire. For the back, I got something new here. I believe back buttons or paddles should be the new standard for controllers. They're a brilliant way of subtly adding more inputs onto a controller. They're seen as just alternative buttons for now, but they could be more. These buttons would have been great for something like Halo Infinite, where instead of having to go through some sub-menu, taking your finger off the move stick, each ability would be assigned to a back button. They have great potential, but would need to be perfective to be large and firm enough to not be inadvertently pressed. These should have been standard already, so maybe next time. Batteries would have to be something to be considered. I've seen arguments for either side of having AA batteries or not, but most get debased since they devolve into fanboy drivel. It doesn't matter to me personally though, since I keep the controller wired. But I get it, sometimes it's just too short or obstructive. Honestly, I kinda lean with needing batteries just because of what might happen when the controller runs out of power. With AA, when you run out, you can just replace them and continue to play wirelessly. Without them, well, when you run out, that's it. Either way, you can still plug in the controller to keep playing. This actually reminds me of one story. I remember being at my friend's house playing on his Xbox. My controller ran out of power, so I asked if he had any batteries. He told me, nah, just use my phone charger behind you. I turned around to grab it and unplugged it to connect to the Xbox. He then said, nah, what are you doing? Just plug it in there. I was confused, holding the charger and controller in my hands. He took them from me and went behind to plug the controller to the wall. The controller then turned on and connected to the Xbox. I was bewildered, wondering how the wall connected to the Xbox. Then I realized the controller just needed power from anywhere to connect wirelessly. Moral of the story is that I guess you can do this if you're desperate enough. Back to the design, I decided to go with a rechargeable battery as part of the controller for a better form factor. Look, it's almost half as thick without the batteries. Honestly, I also don't have any other devices that use double A's all that much. We're also all just inculcated to recharge our things, whether it be our watches, headphones, vacuums, or a whole car. The controller would also include other features such as a 3.5mm port, USB-C, a sync button, haptics, an accelerometer, and gyroscope. That's right, motion controls, baby. I feel like motion controls are so underutilized in games, especially FPS games. I'm serious. Small movements with the controller can make aiming more precise and akin to playing with mouse and keyboard. Try playing Splatoon or even Zelda without them. Whatever Nintendo did to calibrate them really helps with aim. They could be good for navigating menus with a cursor as well. I'll admit though that other games do not really benefit from motion controls. Also, some games have such strong aim assist that motion controls would be more of a hindrance. So, perhaps no motion controls. It's not like I would play with Switch Sports like this. So, there you go. My sketch of what would be the most ideal controller. I could totally see future controllers evolve into something like this, but perhaps not from the big three. I borrow so many aspects of different controllers, so it'd be unrealistic for any official controller to be structured like such. But that's what makes it ideal. It's nothing too flashy, and I didn't put any new gimmicks on it since I wanted to focus on the essentials. Speaking of essential, how, how could I forget the IR camera? There's also plenty of room left to add more to the aesthetic or to modify stick placement and such. Who knows though, I could be completely wrong in 5 years from now, VR controllers are actually what is ideal. As for now, I think this is it. This is my closest approximation of the ideal controller. Yep. Actually hold on, there's one problem here that I've not addressed. Alright, so you know how everyone's always confused about which button is X? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, look at this, I got it. <laughs> yeah, look at this. Yeah, I fixed it. Now nobody will be confused because they're all... <laughs>